This week's episode is brought to you by Fairy Godmother Travel, the official travel agency of Communicore Weekly. Email them today at communicoreweekly at fairygodmothertravel.com and they'll be happy to send you to any Disney vacation you'd like. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And I'm excited to continue this this segment about looking at the Disneyland history. I mean, we haven't really talked about the creation of Disneyland before. Exactly. And, you know, we did have that scare, like, ooh, what would happen if he had never built it? And I think we one. decided that nothing happened. <laughs> Is, isn't that correct? I do believe that's how we left the story. Exactly. Exactly. Which is kind that of That may have been the darkest timeline, though. It could have been. It could have been. Where Eisner but, stole uh, the time machine and went back in time and... And stopped him. And stopped him. Disguised himself as Roy Disney and said, It'll never work, <laughs> Walt. Don't do it. And that's, that's how the story ends. Exactly. Anyway. But <laughs> let's continue the actual story now and go into the history segment. It's time for Disney history. Last week, we talked a bit about Walt's dream of a place where the entire family could come and enjoy time together. This culminated in the Mickey Mouse Park, which unfortunately for Walt was dashed by his brother Roy due to financial hardship. Uh, It would have called the entire studio. However, in March 1952, the park stepped back into the spotlight after being revealed by a Burbank newspaper. Disneyland promised to be an entirely new frontier for Walt Disney. Animated features had to be painstakingly produced over several years, coddled and nurtured from concept to storyboard, to ink and paint, to photography. But once the feature hit the big screen, that was it. No more changes could be made. Walt wanted Disneyland to be different. So if an attraction didn't work correctly, it would be removed. If a ride could be made more exciting, then Walt would plus it. Uh, and he can stroll through the park, listening to the guests' honest feedback, and then make changes on the fly. This would be a whole new ball game for the Disney studio, and one right up Walt's alley. Walt was quoted as saying, I've always wanted to work on something alive, something that keeps growing. I've got that in Disneyland. And he almost sounds like an evil scientist. He almost does. Almost. Okay. So, but the Disneyland revealed to the world in 1952 by the Burbank Daily Review would not be the one we all know and love today. To start, the park was to be built on a 16-acre plot of land on Burbank's Riverside Drive, adjacent to the Disney Studio. The Riverside Drive project would have welcomed guests in a familiar fashion, with railroad tracks encircling the park and a small town center inside the entrance. There would be plenty of room for picnics, a Mississippi steamboat heading across a large lake, and an old town that would look like Frontierland. Several of Walt's original ideas, though, never made it off the drawing board. Instead of uh, costume Disney characters roaming the park, they instead would be statues. There were also plans for singing waterfalls and a zoo of miniature animals. It was a relatively simple plan, one that drew heavily from Walt's ideas for the original Mickey Mouse Park. This Disneyland was uh, estimated to cost just $1.5 million. And on top of that, Walt had assured the Burbank Board of Parks and Recreation that Disneyland would not be a commercial venture and sought no profit whatsoever. Wow. So, whether that was general, genuinely his plan, or just soothing words for the benefit of the uneasy city officials, no one will ever know. But it was enough to win tentative approval from the city for Disney's park on Riverside Drive. Truthfully, Burbank was never fully on board with Walt's plan for Disneyland. Thoughts of loud carnival barkers, dirty streets, and uh, the general unfriendliness of most amusement parks left residents of the city quite suspicious. And despite Walt's pleas that his park would be different, it did not take long for the city board and residents to shift from tenuous allies to outright adversaries. 
Meanwhile, Walt had a much bigger question on his mind. How can he actually go about getting Disneyland built? Even with the plans now public, Roy continued to withhold financial support. The ensuing rift in the studio forced Walt to make the difficult decision to go at it alone. He created Walt Disney Enterprises, which later become Wed Enterprises, as a private company separate from the main studio and, the, and away from the controlling hand of his older brother. As the sole head of Wed Enterprises, Walt was now able to call all the shots. After a short stint with a Zorro television project, Walt gave his Wed staff the go-ahead to start planning Disneyland. Sketching out Walt's vision on paper fell to a new Disney employee, Harper Goff. Having joined the studio just months earlier, Goff played an integral role in imbuing his, uh, this design with an appealing charm. Bearing the initials of its creator, Wet Enterprises represented m much more than a business venture. For Walt, it was personal. The small group, including his brother-in-law, Bill Cottrell, worked out of a tiny building that had actually been relocated from the former Disney Hyperion studio. These early Imagineers were crammed right on top of each other in the WED workshop, as opposed to the studio's animators in their office. And that's how just how Walt wanted it. Like the earliest days of the Disney studio, Walt fostered a spirit of us against the world amongst uh, WED's Imagineers. In that small workshop, the olden days of Hyperion were alive again. As Walt pushed forward with Disneyland, perhaps his biggest triumph was convincing Roy to come on board. The slowly improving studio finances eased most of Roy's concerns, but Walt also had some help once again in the form of ha Hazel George. Hazel so fiercely believed in Walt and his planned park that she created the Disneyland Boosters and Backers Club to recruit donations from fellow Disney employees. Seeing the confidence Walt had instilled in his employees uh, to fully trust his vision so impressed Roy that he relented and gave his support to the project. Roy's monetary contribution was not substantial just $10,000 for planning fees, but his acceptance of Disneyland was worth more than all the money in the studio's pockets. The Brothers Disney were once again working hand in hand, and everyone at the studio was now pulling in the same direction. Walt and Roy were finally united in making Disneyland a reality. Yet, as Disneyland planning stretched into the spring of 1953, the renewed collaboration could not change one fact. The Riverside Drive location had reached a dead end. When Walt planned a project, it tended to get bigger, not smaller. And that's exactly what happened with Disneyland. Walt's endless brainstorming meant that the small Riverside Drive plot had become an impossibility. Not to mention that the increasingly boisterous objections from Burbank residents made these plans completely uh, unobtainable. Happily, the Disney studio eventually put the Riverside Drive land to good use. It just took another 40 years. Where Walt first envisioned this theme park now stands the Walt Disney Feature Animation Building, the home of artists who continue to bring magic to life for present-day audiences. Moving on from Riverside Drive was an undeniable turning point for the Disneyland project, but not one that meant its demise. A new location was needed, and this time it had to be big. Walt just needed to look a little further than across the street from his studio, 30 miles to the southeast to be exact, in an orange grove in Anaheim. In this hour of need, he turned, for the he turned to the Stanford Research Institute, led by Harrison, Buzz Price, and C.V. Wood. The consulting firm agreed to undertake an in-depth study of Southern California in search of a new location for Disneyland. The involvement of SRI heralded the renewed spirit of camaraderie within the Disney studio, for no fee was paid without Roy's approval. The elder Disney was now fully committed to his brother's vision for Disneyland, and any disharmony was in the past. By June 1953, SRI's results were in, and Anaheim was the winner. Although several potential Orange County locales were considered, Anaheim stood apart for its proximity to the new Santa Ana Freeway. The orange groves of Anaheim promised an open canvas for Walt's anim uh, imagination to run wild. Riverside Drive, on the other hand, would have been a choice fraught with compromise in terms of the area and the fact that the residents of Burbank and the city board had become disenchanted with the idea of Disneyland. Anaheim was not only more a uh, more spacious choice, but it was more welcoming as well. All that remained now was the small matter of <laughs> how to pay for the project. Just as the park's plan uh, plans grew too large for Riverside Drive, so too did its budget. The Disney studio was slowly but surely regaining its financial footing after years of wartime-related struggles, but it was still in no condition for such a risky venture. Even after Walt mortgaged his own life insurance to the hilt, more money was still needed. 
In September 1953, Walt appro approached his brother with a new plan for kickstarting Disneyland, and one that would plunge the studio into a completely new market. For the past several years, Walt had created the occasional holiday special for television, and their tremendous success had made the networks desperate to work with Disney on more, uh, a more permanent basis. Perhaps a foray into television was just a solution to Disneyland's stall progress. What if, Walt pondered to Roy, they dangled a weekly television show in return for substantial investment in Disneyland? The brothers agreed that this might be their last and best chance of getting Disneyland off the ground. Roy headed to the television network's offices in New York City, once again tasked with securing the money needed to finance his young brother's dream. But the television studios were wary of this investment, especially since Roy didn't even have any formal plans to present. Disneyland was always going to be a tough sell, but Roy needed to dazzle these executives and get them excited about the park's potential. In short, he needed conceptual drawings, diagrams, and artwork for Disneyland, and he needed them quickly. The only problem was that no such plans existed, and after hearing back from Roy, Walt hurriedly called uh, Herb Ryman, an old studio favorite, who had departed years earlier for uh, New Pastures. And struck by the urgency of the request, Ryman returned to Disney not knowing that he was about to embark on one of the most memorable weekends in Disney history. Although Walt usually worked on Saturdays, the weekend of September 23rd through the 24th, 1953, was something new entirely. Ryman and Walt stayed in an office for the entire weekend, painstakingly translating the ideas for Disneyland from Walt's mind onto paper. By Monday morning, Ryman had drawn a beautiful artistic overview of the planned Disneyland that would be integral to convincing the much-needed investors. Ryman's artistry did the trick, and Roy used these drawings to zero in on the deal with ABC TV and its parent corporation, Paramount Theatres. Months of arduous negotiations throughout the autumn and winter finally culminated in a signed contract on April 2, 1954. In return for a significant investment at Disneyland, Walt would host a weekly television program exclusively on ABC. And how did that turn out for them? We'll tune in next week to find out how the story ends. He's a nerd, he's a, nerd. He's a, geek. He's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah. It's George's Book of the Week. This week's book is An Educational Guide to Walt Disney World by Becky Glinther. And Becky, who's the blogger at Disney In Your Day, sent me a review copy of her book. Uh, and Becky is a former teacher and a current children's librarian, so I kind of knew that I'd want to see what she had written and what she had written about. So Becky's created a book that offers a way for parents, caregivers, and educators to create learning experiences of some sort around every attraction and show at the four Walt Disney World theme parks. So she starts off with Epcot, and with each section usually offers about two pages for each attraction. Becky gives a brief description of the attraction and gives some thoughts on the educational value that could be posed with lessons. Becky even includes a few interesting facts about the subject that could be used as fodder for research. And she does explain in the introduction, of course, that some attractions don't work well educationally, which does make sense. But she does try to make a connection with every attraction, no matter how tenuous. And she does a fairly good job. She offer, uh, also offers uh, books and other websites that will offer further information or just help pique the interest. And, you know, something I like in a fairly unique move, she also includes Dewey Decimal call numbers for subject headings for when you visit your public library. And man, I love the smell of call numbers in the morning. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, Becky sent me a paper copy of the book because you know me, I, I love books, but it's also available as an ebook. And after reading it, I can see how having this as an ebook makes more sense because she does provide links to different websites and uh, different things on the internet as well. Uh, and also, if you have it in ebook, it's something that you can use while you're in the parks because, as she recommends, it's a way to maybe keep the kids entertained somewhat in line or in the queue, you can sort of talk about the history of the ride and uh, some of the details about the subject matter. Now, the book 
of course, even though Becky addresses it, won't settle the age-old question about taking the kids out of school to visit Disney World. But it does provide a clear and concise means for making the trip to Walt Disney World more educational. Besides, Becky's a children's librarian. That's more than enough reason to buy the book. We've got to support our librarians. So this week's book is An Educational Guide to Walt Disney World by Becky Glinther. If it's a legend that you seek, come on and take a peek at the window of the week. This week's window is located at the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World, and it says, Town Square Tailors, Tailors to the President, Bob Phelps, Proprietor. So, Robert Bob Phelps got his start making costumes for movies. He joined Disney in 1967 to help create some of the iconic costumes that cast members have worn over the years. He was in charge of costuming for the Magic Kingdom, Epcot, Tokyo Disneyland, and Disneyland Paris. And he costumed the original audio animatronic figures in the Hall of Presidents. Bob was made Vice President of Costuming, and then he retired in 1995. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. <laughs> princess Fairy Tale Hall in the Magic Kingdom is the place to meet your favorite princesses, and of course, find a few goats. So when you're waiting to meet the princesses, you'll be able to find a table on either end you're on with a bunch of books on it. And each of the books found here feature uh, seven Disney princess films, with the name of the book being the original name of the book uh, of the films in their native language. So the first six books here are uh, Brave, uh, La Belle et les Buttes for Beauty and the Beast, uh, Cendrillon for Cinderella, Rapunzel for Tangled, Cous Froche for The Princess and the Frog, and La Belle et Bois Dormant for Sleeping Beauty. And the final is completely unpronounceable by me. Um, it's... Snedregigin? I don't know. I don't know how to say it, but what does it mean? It actually translates into the Snow Queen, which was the inspiration for Frozen. So it's kind of cool that they put that unpronounceable book title there. Yeah, because then you can just look at it while you're waiting and try to remember how to spell it. Exactly, Before because there's a bunch of N's and there's only like two vowels. It's confusing, guys. <laughs> it's super confusing. We got to do a history with very few vowels once. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we're at the point of our show when it's time for the announcement of our year of a million or so limited time cadets weekly prize winner. And again, everybody's welcome to enjoy or enjoy enter the contest except for members of Communicore Weekly Industries. Yes, They're not so that to basically disqualifies the two of us and Andy yes. and Steve. Exactly. Um, uh, so email communicorweekly at gmail.com with your name and address to enter the contest. Only got a few episodes left, so there still is a chance to win. There is a good chance to win still, guys. But you've got to send us your name. Yes. All right. Yes, you do. So this week's winner is going to get a Fairy Godmother Travel prize pack. And the winner is Brandon B. from Myerstown, Pennsylvania. Hooray! Ooh, Congratulations, Brandon. Yes. Very exciting. By the time they get it, you know, there might be snow in Pennsylvania. Oh, please don't say that. No? Okay, I won't say that. <laughs> no, no snow, all. please. Well, you're in California. You don't see snow. I know. I just don't like hearing the word snow. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Gotcha. So we should say Snedronigan? Yeah. Yeah, let's go to that word I can't pronounce. Which Snedronod? Snedron. Sure, now it sounds like we're making up Pokemon names. That's basically what I'm doing. It's a snow Pokemon. Um... Anyway, so Brandon, <laughs> send us Gotta a... Gotta plow them all. <laughs> Gotta plow them all. Brand, Brand, Brandon, not Brandon, I'm sorry. Brandon, please send us a photo of yourself with the Fairy Godmother Travel prize package so we can post it all over the social medias. Uh, yes. Thank you, guys. Yes. So thank you guys so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. However you get the show, iTunes, YouTube, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Exactly. And email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com. And, you know, tell us your own names you've made up for Pokemon. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Adam Nerding. He's at Jeff Heimbuck. You can also give us a call on the Communicor Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. And visit the Communa store at communicorweekly.com where you can pick up some great t-shirts and other Communicore swag. 
and you can still get your official cadet membership card and sticker at by sending a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And visit patreon.com slash Weekly to see how you can support the greatest online show. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Bandito. Bandito.